difference in stress and its effects. One, because of the personal reasons on their health, and the other is because of the trickle-down effect of an individual in a management position who simply generates stress to the other workers. But any responsible manager in any organization should first have a responsibility to understand what motivates him or her, and secondarily, uh, apply that knowledge and understanding and, and refinement to uh, what motivates others in the organization. So I think they have a, a very serious responsibility to, to understand and to reduce the, the inor inordinate amount of stresses that uh, organizations often place on individuals. The whole idea of managerial style uh, deals with uh, how positive your influence is on other people. Uh, if you as a manager tend to treat people in a positive, affirmative kind of a way, all in all, that's much better than if you treat them in a negative, abrasive sort of a way. And you can still be demanding, you can still be forceful, you can still have high expectations as a manager. The whole idea is, are you able to get the work done without traumatizing the people? Well, call him! Call him right away! What do you want me to tell him? Well, uh, find him a nice space. In what way does your day-to-day -day action affect the other people? Would you be seen by other people as primarily a positive and helpful individual, or would you see, be seen as primarily toxic? Now, what are the toxic actions that some managers take? And what are the nourishing actions that managers can take? And clarify in your own mind those actions and make them very specific. Make them behavioral. A uh, toxic action, for example, is criticizing or scolding an employee in, in the presence of his or her peers. Most of us would agree that that's a no-no in management. But you've seen it done, haven't you? And so have I. A nourishing behavior is simply telling somebody they did a good job. Now, this gets into some self-insight, doesn't it? Some self-awareness of our own behavior. Have you ever asked uh, some of your key employees their impressions of how well you manage? Would that be a frightening thing to do? For some managers it is, for some not at all. Some managers would not hesitate to ask their employees how they think they're managed because they probably do that almost on a routine basis. They get the feedback and they begin to adapt to it. They may not always make people happy in terms of what they do, but they are aware of the human element. The whole thing boils down to the notion of our managerial style and our communication style. When you don't listen carefully to an idea or an explanation, when you don't give feedback about performance, when you bark orders instead of requesting that something be done, you're generating stress for your staff. Think about it for a moment. Does that stress help you to achieve your goals as a manager? Does it get things done? Or is it counterproductive? In your handbook, there is a comprehensive questionnaire to help you focus on your managerial style. It'll give you some idea of how much unnecessary stress you might be causing and how much, in fact, you alleviate. To a large extent, your stress management capability depends on how well you communicate, since many of your problems involve other people and the conflicts that arise. When we have a problem that does involve someone else, we sooner or later have to deal with them. These interactions can sometimes turn out to be stressful and unproductive, but the right communication skills can help you minimize the stress and achieve your desired outcome. When we talk about communication skills as a coping technique with stress, what we're really talking about is how you learn to talk to other people about mutual problems in your relationship. Somebody is doing something that bugs you or upsets you and how do you manage to tell that other person what he or she is doing, how you'd like them to change the behavior and how to do it in a fashion so that you don't escalate the tension, the conflict between you. I think you should slow down, ease up once in a while ease up and never get anything done. The most important requirement for discussing problems with other people in a constructive fashion is to decide what it is that you want. What behavior do you want changed that will satisfy you? What I'm trying to say is everything's become an emergency with you the past few weeks. It's making people edgy, edgier than they need to be. A very important principle 
in learning good communication skills is to learn to say I instead of you. Most of us have the tendency when we're upset with somebody or we're about to begin a discussion about a problem to start saying, you are always late, you upset me, you are not considerate of me, you never think of what I I'm think. Not angry, it's just... You're chronically that. angry, Emily, don't you see that? <laughs> there is a reason. All you're doing by these broad general labels of you, you're antagonizing the other person. The immediate response is the fists out. The other person will start attacking you, and you're preparing the ground for a nice name-calling session where you're each going to tell each other what's wrong with each other. You don't even like the way I pull up weeds. If you really want to do something about changing the situation, one way to do it is to put the onus on yourself. I am upset by your behavior. I get angry when I see you coming late. At least nobody can get antagonized by the fact that you are having these emotions. You have every right to have any emotion that you like. And it makes it much easier for the other person to respond to your concerns. It takes practice to remember to say I instead of you. Such as, I'm not sure I understand the point, instead of, uh, you're not making any sense. Just stop yourself before you say anything to make sure the next sentence out of your mouth begins with the word I. There's some subtlety involved in using I statements effectively because even an I statement can make someone very defensive if you say it in an accusing tone. And also, try to be specific. Suppose you'd like to say to someone, uh, stop bugging me, you're getting on my nerves. Now you could say, you know, uh, I'm the type who likes my peace and quiet and I get distracted from my work when there are too many people around. You might get your point across, but you could be misunderstood. How about, I find it hard to concentrate when you come into my office as often as you do. It's very direct, it's very specific. Just be careful to choose the right time and place and the right tone of voice. One very basic rule of thumb in discussing problems with other people, in communicating about difficulties with other people, is to keep the discussion short. Particularly at the beginning, when we're trying to learn new ways of doing things, it's very hard to go on for any length of time without slipping into bad habits. So at the beginning, keep it to 10, 15 minutes. That's really all you can do without beginning to rake off up the past to talk about everything else that bothers you about the person. And if you haven't really resolved the problem at the end of 10, 15 minutes, just say, well, we've gone as far as we can go now. Can we make another appointment? And we'll give another stab of it. Better 10 good constructive minutes than two hours going round in circles. Problem solving, evaluating your managerial style, paying attention to how you communicate, are only a few of the options that can help you manage stressful situations. There are others, like learning to delegate better or learning to manage your time more effectively. Whatever you decide to do, it's important to remember that you don't have to resolve everything all at once. Putting yourself under that pressure can turn stress management itself into something very stressful. And the most important thing we don't mean when we talk about stress management is a series of cut and dried formulae that you're going to apply blindly to any given situation. Here is a stressor. Now I'm doing five minutes of relaxation followed by five minutes of working on my thoughts and a little bit of communication and a little bit of problem solving, end of stressor. That's obviously not the kind of way we can deal with these situations. What you now have is you have a number of resources at your disposal. And to the degree that you can learn to look at each new situation with a fresh and unjaundiced eye, get out of the rut take a different way of looking at it. Uh, to that degree, you can start taking the resources you have and using them in innovative ways, combining them. Some situations, relaxation may not be appropriate at all. Use something else. You may even find that you have invented some stress-reducing strategies that are better than anything we've got. So much the better for that. But the important thing is that you've changed your perception of stress from something that happens to you that you can't do anything about to an inevitable part of the human existence that you can do a great deal about. Get back with you after the meeting. Herb Malcolm's office. Sorry, he's in a meeting. I'll have him get back to you. Have you seen Linda? She's in the conference room. Don't tell me I flew in for the project meeting. They started without me. They're having a pre-meeting meeting.
I just wanted to tell you all that finally our development proposal for the Logan properties has been accepted by the city since all the contingencies have been met. And so, we did it, and uh, now the real work begins. Paul? Well, I'm sorry Jerry can't be with us today, but I'd like to welcome back Lou. We all missed you, Lou. Now, everyone, Jerry and everyone in this room, worked tremendously hard to put together an innovative, workable development plan. Now, great teamwork. Superb team. And I'd like to get right on with the agenda of the project meeting. Elsa? Yeah. Uh, as you know, Paul and I have been working on revising the schedule. It's one thing to uh, get the job done, get the work done, get promoted, make the money, and uh, barely be alive at the end of the process. It's quite another thing to be whole and human and successful and personally fulfilled and have a feeling of gratification, have good health and be personally effective and have all those other things besides. And that's the difference between being able to manage stress effectively and being overwhelmed by it. Uh, it's going to accrue greatly to the benefit of the company. Okay, so far it looks like we're going to have a very successful project. Now we have to build it, we have to lease it, and we have to pay for it, so let's get to work. Let's do it. All right. Oh, boy. In the next and final program of this series, we'll move on from life at Clark Heidecker and the everyday stresses we've been dealing with so far. With further commentary from our consultants, we'll tackle stress management from a broader perspective, one that includes nutrition, physical fitness, and other factors that influence the overall quality of our lives. You'll have a chance to consider your stress management techniques as they apply to setting personal goals and priorities. Now, in your handbook, you'll find more material on the topics we've covered in this program. Remember, in any given situation, you always have two choices. You can either try to change the situation, or you can try to change the way you feel about it. And this is true whether it's a minor problem or a major issue concerning important decisions in your life. The material on this video cassette is protected by copyright. It is for private use only, and any other use, including copying, reproducing, or performance in public, in whole or in part, is prohibited by law.